ISTAT and Association of PwC are delighted to launch a series of aviation insights for those working within the aviation industry. These insights will be delivered both in podcast and video format, and our first interview is with Avalon CEO, Donald Slattery. Donald, it's been a busy year for you with the acquisition of CIT. Can you talk us through that and what actually scale and the size means to you now? Well, I suppose, Jerry, it's, it's almost a year since we started to um, work on the project in a serious way. We signed the purchase agreement in October of last year, and uh, we closed the deal in April. So the good news from our perspective is the integration has gone extremely well. Uh, we finished the uh, HR piece, which is central, key, and uh, we've been very pleased with how that has gone. The data migration and the systems uploads and the financing systems and treasury systems, all of that is well on track and we expect to have it complete by the third quarter. And I think from our perspective, the good news is the market backdrop uh, continues to be strong. Uh, equity markets have rallied um, since we did the deal in early October and you know whether that's the Trump bump or whether it's a more positive uh, macroeconomic backdrop really doesn't matter. Equities are up and we care about that because you know Avalon was a public company and we think about the valuation of aircraft lessors you know a combination of the value of the fleet but also what would be the value of our company if we ever decided to go public again. Going back to what you said earlier on um, in one of your first points, which was the merger and the, of the culture and the people, you've obviously got two very different cultures between what was Avalon and what was CIT. How did you even start to think about merging those two cultures together and how has that worked out? Yeah, so if you read the textbooks on, on integration, what they will tell you is that most M&A transactions fail to deliver on the financial objectives because of lack of cultural integration. Okay, so I suppose we were alive to that risk. Um, we saw it ourselves firsthand, you know, 25 years ago at GPA and GCAS. And so what we did is we worked really hard in the planning before the close to define, you know, how we would integrate the cultures. B, and this is probably the most important, we imposed the Avalon cultural set on the integrated business. And our culture is defined uh, under the acronym TRIBE transparency, respect, insightfulness, bravery, and ebullience. And then when we did that, what became very clear very quickly was there wasn't a big cultural difference between the Avalon team and the legacy CIT team. What was different was the history of the companies. Avalon is young, it's a seven-year-old company, very entrepreneurial background to the organization. CIT had been in business for many, many, many decades. That, that's what was different, but actually the drive, the energy, the passion of, the, of our new colleagues is right up there with the Avalon team. So the cultural piece seems to have gone pretty well. Going back to something different in, within CIT and the difference between Avalon and CIT is obviously the makeup of the fleet. How did you merge those two together and what's the plans in the future to be able to create that asset culture essentially going forward? The difference between the Avalon fleet and the CIT fleet was actually down to the average age of the portfolio. Avalon had the youngest aircraft fleet in the world market amongst the top 10 lessors. Uh, the CIT portfolio was a little older. So um, in the first instance, when you put them together, what it tells you is we retain the youngest fleet age of the top three lessors, top three being defined as ourselves, GCAS and, and, and AirCap. Then you look to the uh, older equipment in the portfolio. So Avalon's core strategy and core you know, risk mitigant is to retain the youngest fleet age. And as you know and I know from many years in the industry, that equals lowest impairment risk, equals the best opportunity for financing, et cetera, et cetera. So our focus will be to continue to keep the youngest fleet age. So therefore, by definition, we will divest ourselves over time and in a very careful way of some of the older aircraft that's in that, in that fleet. Um, the second is the mix of aircraft. Um, so we're very focused now on new technology equipment, okay? So on the narrowbody side, Max and Neo, and on the twin aisle, 787, A350 and A330 Neo. And we are the biggest customer or lessor on the A330 Neo platform. So what you ex should expect to see from Avalon is a divestment of the older equipment over time. We're still considering what role we want to play in the regional jets, to be honest. You know, our position has been to date that unless we can be a major player in that sector, then we probably don't want to play in it. 
have some of the skill sets that you brought in from the employees and CIT benefit you in terms of where you're developing and how you're looking at these portfolios? There is a deep reservoir of knowledge in our new colleagues, particularly in the area of used aircraft remarketing and all of the technical uh, work streams that travel with that. And you know, you and I have been in this industry a long time. The easy part of this game is buying new airplanes and putting them out on 12-year leases. The challenging part is to deal with aircraft coming off lease, dealing with redeliveries, and putting them on delivery to the next lessee. It's much more complicated, much more involved, and requires a lot more skill set. And so that is the one major uh, bucket of IP, if you like, that has come with this acquisition, a deep reservoir of knowledge in managing transitions. Moving away from these topics and looking at, say, the funding side of things, where are you seeing that and where you are in the investment grade process? I mean, the stats with Avalon are pretty much uh, as follows, you know, give or take a couple of dollars here, about $8 billion of equity invested in the company. Um, our balance sheet by the end of this year is going to be close to $30 billion. So first and foremost, our debt equity ratio is quite prudent and quite conservative, and we intend to continue to manage the business in that prudent range in the sort of you know, two and a half to three to one maximum level. And that's what you expect to see for an investment grade uh, lessor. So that's the first thing. The second is given the scale of the balance sheet and the scale of our growth you know, year in, year out uh, for the foreseeable future, this business must fund itself in the capital markets. We've been a very successful participant in the bank market over the last seven years. And if you look at the cost of our debt that we fund ourselves in the bank market, it's actually you know, investment grade type cost of funds. However, given the scale of our needs, we have to diversify. And we started that earlier this year with the eight and a half billion dollars of debt capital we issued for the acquisition, which was a five and a half billion dollar term loan. Uh, and a $3 billion inaugural bond. So these were two very large issuances, very well received by the market, um, multiple times oversubscribed. Some will say, oh, you just hit the market at the right time. Others will say it was a good story. I think it's a bit of both. The question is, where do we go from here? So the facts are, Avalon is not yet investment grade. Um, we are on that journey. Uh, we have stated publicly and we continue to do so that it is our intention to get to investment grade as quickly as we can. To get there, uh, we need to issue more unsecured debt, so we need to re release some of our secured collateral. And we need to increase our FFO over debt, so our funds free cash flow from operations. And finally, because we're part of a large Chinese conglomerate, ultimately the rating agencies will look to our parentage which is Bohai Capital, and ultimately to our largest shareholder, and how that interaction flows ultimately to an investment grade. Are, is the interaction between yourself and the radio agencies very transparent in terms of they've given you certain metrics you have to get to? And if that's true, then are you able to put a finite timeline as to when you think you'll get there? No, you could never. It's, it's impossible to put a finite timeline. So I would say when you're dealing with the agencies, uh, each one is different. Each one thinks about the sector in a different way. Um, each one has a different role to play in the capital markets. First and most important thing is to have ongoing regular dialogue with the agencies, absolute transparency on all issues. Um, I would say dealing with the agencies is primarily science, so it's primarily metrics and there's a little bit of art. And atmospherics is very important to the agencies. So for example, continuity of management team, succession planning in an organization, uh, nature of the relationship with your shareholder, your, your strategic shareholder, that sit outside, if you like, the financial metrics, but are very important. So it's impossible to say, you know, we'll be investment grade by month X or quarter Y. The key point, and I think what the bond investors are seeing and hearing is, we run the business to investment grade metrics. And, you know, we would be optimistic of, of reducing our cost of borrowing in the capital markets. Saying that, we continue to be a very active borrower in the bank market, and we continue to borrow there at you know, pure investment grade metrics in terms of pricing. You touched on management team. You've had the ability to retain all of your senior management team or executive management team throughout this process. How do you keep them motivated? Well, what motivates me as an executive and, and my senior colleagues and teams and partners, and you know, these were the founders of the firm here, you know, what, we get, what, 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 what excites us and interests us with the Avalon story is that when the legacy is written, when the book is written in 20 or 30 or 40 years time, that there'll be a chapter on us which says, these guys built the best business in the aircraft leasing space, not just in terms of the quality of the, 
you know, the shareholder returns, the financial metrics, but they built a business that the best and brightest wanted to work there. They enjoyed it. They treated their colleagues with respect. Um, you know, they had a culture, which, which, which you call here, which is our deep learning culture. So my philosophy is, if you come to work at Avalon, my job as the CEO is to ensure you become a better and more rounded person. I mean, a lot of people in this industry would have expected you know, the management to move on. I mean, if we were asked once, we were asked a thousand times, well, what are you going to do next? Well, what I'm going to do next is take Avalon from $30 billion to $60 billion. And you get an opportunity like this maybe once in your life. So, you know, you take it, you run with it, and it's very exciting. And, uh, you know, we built this business, and even though it's not owned by us anymore, it's our company. And we are associated by it reputationally and emotionally connected to it. On growth, Donald, you've intimated that you would like Avalon to be number one in the world in terms of scale and size. How are you going to achieve that? You know, this is a very difficult market to get to number one because most of our bigger competitors are growing and have aspirations for growth. So, uh, you know, getting to number one is, is quite the challenge. So again, we go back to the facts. The facts at the moment are we have locked in growth. So in terms of our future order book with the manufacturers, give or take, you know, four to five billion dollars a year for the next five to six years. But most of our big competitors have also, you know, locked in growth, if not, not dissimilar. So it doesn't move the needle. So in my mind, uh, for us to get to number one, um, two things have got to happen. One is we've got to achieve an investment grade credit rating because you simply can't finance a business of that scale unless you're investment grade, okay? You can't be aspiring to investment grade. And the second is I think there'll be one other major acquisition uh, rather than a series of small acquisitions. And then we'll supplement that by organic growth, whether it's our direct orders with manufacturers or a large portfolio or two at size when we see, when we see opportunity. Now, the question is, when will that happen? Um, there, you know, the, the CIT transaction came at the perfect time from our perspective, uh, in that it wasn't a distress play, but you had a willing seller. Okay? Um, we haven't seen a distress play in this industry really since the ILFC AIG trade. And we work in a cyclical industry. So if you're pragmatic and you're looking out over the next number of years, you know, your experience will tell you there will be distress eventually. I can't actually see it at the moment, but it will come. And then looking at where market rates are today, mm. does that give you any concern? Absolutely. It gives me lots of concern. And, um, you know, one of the reasons I was attracted uh, to H&A as an owner is because we had a joint vision of becoming the single largest purchaser of aircraft in the world market through a combination of our needs as a lessor, but frankly, much more importantly, H&A uh, Group's airlines needs, which are multiples of ours. And so in simple terms, we now negotiate with the OEMs with one voice. So there's a dedicated specialist team of Avalon executives and the group executives negotiating with Boeing and Airbus, GE, Rolls, et cetera, et cetera. And we are negotiating in much larger scale um, but with, and with a much more strategic perspective. And the manufacturers um, are, I wouldn't say getting comfortable with that dynamic because obviously it creates uh, pricing tension, but they are beginning to strategically appreciate uh, the influence and power that we will have as a, buying, as a buying group in the global market. So I expect Avalon to, you know, with its group parentage, to be the single largest purchaser of airplanes and therefore getting the best price in the market and therefore positioning ourselves well for growth. But I would say currently, uh, the lease rates that lessors are garnering for new equipment, you know, delivery next year, the year after, the year after, are probably below where we expected them to be because of competition. Do we still believe in cyclicality? Because if there continues to be this bow wave of capital coming in, how is that going to shake out and where is the exit point going to be and distress going to come at some point in the future? I know I fundamentally believe that the industry is cyclical and re will remain cyclical. Uh, what changes every cycle is the turn, you know, the peak and the trough, the the intensity of each one, the the time period between both, and you know, as we look out over the next two to three years, I can't see anything that's going to take uh, the gloss off the current pretty, you know, healthy state of the industry. It's all about supply demand at the airline side. Um, the, you know, the area that I've been nervous about for some time and continue to be is. 
you know, I just think there are too many airplanes being produced. But at the same time, I'm, I'm sort of dumbfounded every year that, you know, airlines still have the capacity to take them. Um, you know, again, there's stresses, I think, stresses with a small s around the wide body space over the next couple of years. Maybe too many 787s, maybe too many unsold A350s. Uh, you know, the A330neo has gone from being quite a challenged scenario six or nine months ago, and I was publicly stating that, to a scenario where we have no airplanes left before, I think it's one in 2020, okay? So that's been quite a sea change. Um, and I think the reason for that is that Airbus are now selling the aircraft and roles are, are uh, you know, dynamically behind trying to uh, support the sales of the airplane. You know, we've got interest rates are on the way up though, Jerry. Okay, the dollar was strengthening, now it's kind of weakening again. So that's, that's good for our emerging cli uh, airline clients. Oil was going up, but it's kind of coming back down again. So that's good. So it seems to be, you know, we've headwinds and tailwinds uh, on a you know, week by week, month by month basis. So typically what happens in this scenario, if you look back over 50 years, is you have some kind of a shock event, which, you know, God forbid, doesn't occur. Given your relationship with your owner, H&A being Chinese, does that give you a competitive advantage in this market? The answer to that is it's a double-edged sword. One, uh, the positive, if you like, is we're part of the Hainan Group. And today, I think it's about 25 airlines, they operate in China. So we, through that uh, network of sister companies, have a unique perspective into, the, into that market. Um, however, we deal with them on an arm's length basis. Because we're part of a public company, Bohai Capital. In summary, we don't get any special treatment, we don't get any sweetheart deals because we're part of the group. Certainly Avalon can bring the best of East and West, but we are, the, we are unique in terms of our knowledge base of how the airlines are actually operating and what their demand is for airplanes. What do you think poses the greatest threat to this industry at this point in time and rolling forward over the next five or ten years? All, all players in this industry are reliant on the capital markets one way or the other. So I think distress or a breakdown in those markets like we saw in 07, 08, is the single biggest threat to fund the capex that the airlines require. And you know, I don't know what it is for next year, but I think this year it's in the sort of 130, 135 billion dollar range. These are very, very big numbers. So I think that's the risk that I would be concerned most about. And unfortunately, it's the risk we can't control. But that risk also represents a significant opportunity if you're well capitalized and you've got a strong parent. So I would assume that you'd be looking at that as, yes, manage, and what you have, but that if you are in that position, that you'd be looking to take advantage of. Yeah, if you can, you know, but if you're looking at systemic or systematic breakdown, then everyone's in trouble. If you're looking at sort of what I would call market stresses, um, you know, you want to be opportunistic in those scenarios to the extent that you can be. I think that the metric that we will continue to run the business to is that very conservative debt equity ratio, because that gives you a lot of downside protection. So Donald, you're a young man. You've achieved a lot so far. Um, I'm sure you're going to achieve an awful lot going forward. If you're looking back in 40 years' time, what would you like to be remembered as? I've been involved, in, as you know, I said earlier, for a long time in the business. I have been lucky enough to work with some fantastic people. I've been very lucky to start and launch a few businesses in this space, and it's been a fantastic journey. But I think the reality is, when you look back and say, well, what did Dad do? Or what did granddad do? I don't think anybody's going to care about, you know, Donald Slattery helped launch the A330neo or Donald Slattery's organization uh, bought 75 maxes. I, I, that'll be an irrelevancy. Um, so I think what I would like to deem success now and uh, is, you know, can we make a real difference in people's lives? Okay, now that sounds a bit generic. So you, you move down to level and say, okay, what specifically can you do? And so I think, um, and I touched on this earlier this year, but it's something I'm, there's a bit of a burning desire coming on this, right? So I think given the scale of our, our industry's financial clout, given our you know, relative level of profitability, given how well we do personally out of the industry, uh, we are now pivoting, I think, to a point where the industry, the aircraft leasing industry specifically, uh, should seriously consider the establishment of a foundation whereby we will contractually agree to commit a certain amount of capital into that foundation every year. So what would the foundation do? Um, it would have a mandate basically for the betterment of people's lives. Um, and at the core of that, I think, is education globally, right? And so I think that's the core ethos. 
And so I think it's pretty simple, I, you know, and I think it's what I'm calling the $100 per month per aircraft, okay? And so in very, very simple terms, what I would call on is all of our peers in the industry, big and small, growing, um, aspirational in the industry, if we made a commitment, each of the companies through the CEOs, to contribute 100 bucks per aircraft per month into the foundation, okay? And I think that's balanced because the big guys pay more, small guys pay less. But it's easy to intellectualize $100 per month. People can kind of emotionally get with it. My gut is that if we got that going, given the number of airplanes around the world that are leased, you could you know, have a foundation that's being funded sustainably in the multi-millions of dollars per year. And you know, in 40 years' time, uh, that could be a half a billion dollar foundation that we helped to start. And you might have 100,000 kids who were put through high school or university because of that. And I think I'd be pretty happy if we, if we got to that, just that alone. Thanks to the Avalon CEO, Donald Slattery, for joining us today. We hope our audience enjoy it, and we look forward to seeing you at the second event.